Back in the book, The American Discovery of Europe by Jack D. Forbes. We're going to belly flop to chapter three. It says here, seagoing Americans, navigation in the Caribbean and vicinity. Marine time navigation by first American peoples stands as a very neglected subject, especially since the topic extends to modern times, with native people serving as sailors with the Portuguese British, United States, and other na navies and merchant marines. The subject is significant not only for the study of issues such as the diffusion of genetic characteristics, but for establishing Native Americans as active participants in the process of travel and discovery and the resultant spread of cultural inventions to Europe, Africa, the Pacific, and Asia, all right? spreading what the culture and creating cultural inventions in those regions who americans bringing their culture over there establishing cultural inventions creating them in those areas of europe africa and the pacific and asia pay attention much information has now been lost and must be reconstructed from the often fragmentary records left by early European observers or from archaeological and oral historical sources, all right? Sources, primary sources. We must also bear in mind that the Spanish and Portuguese intrusions into the Americas after 1492 must have had a very chilling effect upon American navigation, even as the Portuguese thoroughly disrupted Indian, Malayo, Indonesian, and other shipping in the Indian Ocean and South China Sea region. Native Americans were soon subject to seizure as slaves or forced laborers, all right? Who? American Indians, not Africans. Who were the Spanish really enslaving? American Indians, they had local labor, and then they had their all, all their undesirable people they were getting rid of in their own countries and in Europe. These forced laborers, uh, these American Indians, Naborias, almost everywhere from the Carolinas to South America, okay? From the Carolinas to South America, Indian slavery, not Africans. Check out my series from Indigenous American to African American, especially from parts 12 on up. We talk, we get into the you know, true enslavement of people, right, in the Americas. We go through primary sources showing that this is just correlating what we showed in those videos. It was big. They had millions of people over here to so-called enslave or put in forced labor or indenture, right? They didn't have to go anywhere else. And then they had their own undesirable people in Europe. Again, we've gone through the 
primary sources. This is just more correlation. You guys got to understand it was big almost everywhere from the Carolinas to South America. And after the English entered the field along the New England to Nova Scotia coast as well. The Portuguese also kidnapped many persons from Newfoundland, Labrador and Brazil regions. All right. This is big. The Portuguese, Sephardic and Moorish people, they were going up there and grabbing the Botox and a lot of other uh, indigenous peoples from those areas, bringing them to Cape Verde and other parts of America. Thus, it probably became increasingly dangerous to go out to sea after the 1490s, and especially in parts of the greater Caribbean. The description of native shipping must reflect the need to be secretive, and therefore many things are probably hidden from our present view. Nonetheless, what we do know suggests that Native Americans of the Caribbean could have been justly referred to as the Polynesians of the Americas. <laughs> the Polynesians of the Americas, huh? Family. And that shipping was also very important along the west coast of the continent, at least from Peru north to Mexico and in California and the Pacific Northwest. Thor Heyerdahl has stated that Native Americans had levels of navigational expertise and culture to match anything in the old world. Again, I'm going to repeat that. Pay attention. Thor Heyerdahl, primary sources, people who saw the people, people who experienced the culture and the expertise. He says, again, he stated that American Indians had levels of navigational expertise and culture to match anything in the old world. This is the true old world. What did Louis Agassiz say? This is the oldest land. This is the true old world. It's not new. J. Eric S. Thompson, an expert on Maya peoples, has referred to the Putun, Chontal Akalan Maya, both as the Phoenicians of the new world. The Phoenicians of the new world, huh? Huh, something we should look into, right? What we've been saying. Where the Phoenicians coming out of? The Phoenicians came out of Canaan or the promised land. Where is the true promised land? What is a Phoenician? Phenoch, Phenoch, Enoch, Phoenician. Again, a lot of Danites got mixed in and called Phoenicians. It literally means seafaring peoples. Seafaring peoples. That's why they're referring to the Mayas as the Phoenicians of the new world. Seafarers of the new world. The Maya peoples. Seafarers. Again, Going back to my series, Untold Ancient American Truth. Make sure to catch that series as well. You guys got to catch up to the presentations. A lot of good information we've gone over, especially reading over the Queen Mu books and all the legends of the Hindu and the Nagas, how it's the Mayas who actually went over there, right? The Mayas went over there. They became known as the Nagas, right? We're seeing here that the Mayas people, this guy who's an expert, again, J. Eric S. Thompson, an expert on Maya peoples has referred to the Putun Chontal Akalan Maya, both as the Phoenicians of the New World. All right, they were navigators, they were seafarers. They could have definitely went all the way over to Hindustan or Bharat, Bharat, and as the Argonauts of the Western Caribbean. All right, they were the Argonauts of the Western Caribbean, the Maya. They were all over the Caribbean seafaring. Listen to this. You know they were getting around and encountering the Caribs and Arawaks and Taino people that were also seafarers and other seafarers from America, right? Their exploits in the period from circa 800 to the 16th century will be discussed below. Let us first look at the testimony of the earliest European invaders. One of the items of evidence that motivated Cologne to voyage to the west was of course his meeting americans in galway all right remember he met american indians sometime around 1477 all right way before he came he was in laws he knew about america the evidence would seem to indicate that they had arrived in ireland on two logs or two dugout boats probably lashed together to make a more stable vessel for travel on the high seas as we shall see, this is very much like a technique used by Lenape Delaware people in sailing from New Jersey to Virginia. During the 1480s, presumably, 
Cologne also learned from a settler of the Azores that persons had seen co covered barks that seemed to be built in such a way they never could sink. Las Casas refers to these boats as almadias or canoas con casa movediza as dugouts or canoes with houses, vessels that could not sink, but that were blown about by the winds from island to island. Why wouldn't they sink? Most likely because they were double holed or outfitted with outriggers or other stabilizers. The fact that houses were built on them suggests that the sides were built up with planking. These boats may well have resembled a large trading vessel, all right? These were ships, all right? Large trading ships, probably of the Putun Maya, of the Putun Maya seized by Cologne off the Honduras coast at one of the Guanacha or Guanaja Islands. This trading boat was apparently coming from a copper rich region. Listen to this, Columbus intercepted a Maya ship. It was coming from a copper rich region or at least from an area close to such a region. Hernando Colon at first hand witness tells us that there arrived at that time a canoe as long as a galley and eight feet wide. Eight feet wide, listen, eight feet wide made a single tree trunk from a single tree trunk. That's a big tree. Like the other Indian canoes, it was freighted with merchandise from the western regions around New Spain. A midship, it had a palm leaf like that which the Venetian gondolas carry. This gave complete protection against the rain and waves. Are you hearing this? They literally intercepted a Maya ship that was trading. It was trading. Under this awning were the children and women and all the baggage and merchandise. There were 25 paddlers aboard. The Spaniards quickly seized the freight boat while Admiral Colon, Hernando's father, gave thanks to God. Then he took aboard the costliest and handsomest things in that cargo cotton mantles all right listen cotton mantles. this is what the mayas had and they were trading cotton already so they were growing cotton right who taught who how to grow cotton cotton mantles and sleeveless shirts shirts all right they had their own little shirt business <laughs> or trade embroidered and painted in different designs and colors all different colors shirts that's the maya they had it going they were traders of shirts being like shawls worn by the Moorish women of Granada, just like the shawls. That doesn't mean they're Moorish. That's a type of clothing. Who invented what? First, America is the true old world. Everything else is a copy. That's why they're saying ish, more ish women of Granada. It looks kind of ish with cord and pitch. All right. So long wooden swords with a groove on each side were edged should be and which were fastened with cord and pitch they had swords too flint knives that cut like steel hatches resembling the stone hatches used by the other indians but made of good copper and hawks bells of copper and crucibles to melt it the cargo boat was also outfitted with provisions including such roots and grains as the indians of espanola eat also a wine made of maize that tasted like English beer. A wine that tasted like English beer. All right, you hear that? So look at everything that the Maya were trading. Everything they found in the Maya's chip. Where were they going with that? Imagine, where were they taking all this stuff? Imagine all these luxury items going around the world. The Maya were bringing that everywhere. And again, who brought maize? Who brought maize? to the other people on the other side. How did people on the other side get my ease? Now remember those drawings they show, the eagle man giving my ease to, you know, that's their gods, Babylonian gods, Marduk and all that. But look at him, that's an Aztec warrior dressed as an eagle. You know, we dressed as eagles. Who was bringing my ease? Maya, look at this. Who was bringing all this stuff around? So wine made of my ease, they obviously had my ease, right? <laughs> that tasted like English beer, that's chicha, that's what we call chicha. They had as well many of the almonds, cacao beans, right, chocolate, trading chocolate 
trading vessel of the kind that could easily have traveled to the southern United States or along the northern coast of South America. The palm leaf matting used as an awning suggests also knowledge of sailing, since such matting can easily catch the wind and be used as sails. Sails of woven matting were used along the Pacific coast and also by the Caribs of the Antilles. On his third voyage, Colon also saw a very large boat, reminiscent of the ones that were seen in the Azores. He states their canoes in the Gulf of Paria, Venezuela area are very big and a better workmanship than those others and lighter. And amidst ships and every one, there is an apartment like a cabin in which I saw that the principal men went with their women. Oh man, it would seem likely that those large boats with covered areas and cabins were not simply dugouts, but had been augmented by planking to make a width of eight feet, for example. All right, these are literally ships, all right? It says the use of planking is known for larger Caribbean vessels. As we shall see, Niccolo Silasio, a Sicilian philosophy instructor, had a friend on Colón's second voyage, Guillermo Coma, who supplied him with information on the Caribbean. He states that the larger carib boats are made of boards fastened together and are 80 feet long. They stand five palms above the water and the same number of palms in breadth instead of oars. They use broad paddles like Baker's Peel, but somewhat shorter. In this manner, they sail to the neighboring islands. Sometimes they go greater distances, even as far as a thousand miles in search of plunder. Silasho may not be a very reliable source, being one of the early perpetrators of the sensationalistic story of Carib cannibalism. Probably the boats he describes at second hand were only partly built up with planks on a dugout base. Nonetheless, the impression of Carib navigational ability in boat size is probably accurate. Now let us review Cologne's impressions of Native American boats and navigation on his first voyage. In his letter to Santangel, I remember in my previous video, Santangel was actually the person who really funded Columbus, uh, you know, <laughs> let's say Salvador Fernandez Sarco, that's his real name. Mr. Sarko, all right, from now on, I'm not going to say Cologne, I'm going to say Mr. Sarko. All right, you guys understand I'm talking about Columbus. Santangel, a Sephardic Jew, he was the one that really funded the voyage. Not Ferdinand and not the Queen, they just allowed it, they didn't fund it. Cologne said that the Americans were, or <laughs> Sarko, I forgot, let's go. Sarko said that the Americans were of keen ingenuity and people who navigate all those seas so that it is marvelous the good account they give of everything. In all the islands, they have many canoes resembling rowan fru fustas, some smaller and some larger. And many are larger than a fusta of 18 or banks. They are not so wide because they are made of a single log, but a fusta could not keep up with them in a rowan because they go faster than one can believe. And in these, they navigate to all those islands, which are innumerable and carry the merchandise. One of these canoes I have seen with 70 and 80 men in it and each one with his oar. All right, that's from Sarko's own words. <laughs> Some of Sarko's comments in his 1492 diary are worth citing. On October 13, he noted that the Americans came to the ship with almadias, dugouts, that are made from the trunk of one tree, like a long boat and of one piece and worked, carved marvelously, and large enough so that in some of them 40 to 45 men came, and others smaller down to some in which came a man alone. They row with a paddle like that of a baker and go marvelously, and it is capsizes on them. They then throw themselves in the water, and they write and empty it with gourd containers. On November 30, Sarko reportedly saw a handsome dugout or canoe 95 palmos in length made of a single timber, and in it 150 persons would fit navigate, and in it 150 persons would fit and navigate. A short distance away they saw an inlet in which he saw five very large dugouts, which the Indians call canoes like very handsome fustas, fashioned in such a way that it was, he says, a pleasure to see them. The canoes were under very thick trees. 
not only was Sarko impressed with the size and beauty of the American boats, but he also commented upon their seaworthiness. Near Haiti, he found in mid-channel a canoe with one Indian alone in it. The admiral marveled at how he was able to stay afloat, the wind being great. Frequent reference was also made to the sighting of canoes with large numbers of persons on board. For example, on December 17, a canoe arrived at Haiti from Tortuga Island, or Turtle Island, with some 40 men on board. At Haiti, also many large canoes were used to unload a Spanish vessel of everything from the ship, thus indicating large capacities for carrying gear. In 1498, at Ieri, Trinidad, Colón was met by a canoe with 25 young men, all armed with shields, bows, and arrows. But generally, after the first voyage, references are no longer made so frequently due to fewer first-hand written sources, greater familiarity with native cultures, and an overwhelming preoccupation with slave raiding and military conquests. Exceptions will be noted below. They were too busy. I hear what they're saying, too busy enslaving the Indians. Colón also frequently referred to the great numbers of canoas that were seen. In the Trinidad Gulf of Paraya region, he reports that there came again an infinity of canoes loaded with people. On other occasions, he referred to up to 120 boats in one place and to the numberless canoes of the Caribs. <sighs> the Caribbean natives also had boats, sheds, and ports from which to land and unload cargo all of which indicates the high development of maritime activity. On November 27, Colón saw a handsome dugout or canoe made of one madero log as big as a fusta of 12 rowing benches drawn up under a shelter or shed made of wood and covered with big palm leaves so that neither sun nor water could damage it. It was in this vicinity that the Castilians also saw the boat of 95 palmos in length and in a different place. Five very large boats and going along a path that went out to them, they came upon a very well arranged boat shed covered in such a way that neither sun nor water could do harm to the canoes. And under it, there was another canoe made of one timber like the others, like a fusta of 17 benches. And it was a pleasure to see the decorations that it had in its beauty. All right, so you see how Columbus and all these people are describing the ships and boats they were seeing here, right? The voyages of Cologne also provide us with a great deal of additional information on the extent of geographical knowledge possessed in the 1490s by Caribbean Americans. According to Barnaldes, the Caribbean people had no diversity in language, and this may be the result of navigation, for they were masters of the sea, and it was because they had no means of navigation that in the Canaries they did not understand one another, and each island had its own language. In the north, the Lucayo or Yucayo people of the Bahamas were knowledgeable about the North American mainland, Cuba and Haiti. Cologne wrote, I will leave for another very large island, which they call Colba or Cuba. And it, they say there are many and very large ships and many traders or sailors. And from this island, I go to another, which they call Bohio, which also they say is very big. But I have already decided to go to the mainland. The natives that Colón kidnapped said that Cuba was a journey of one day and a half by canoe. They tell him by signs that there are 10 big rivers and that with their canoes they cannot circle it in 20 days. And the Admiral understood that large ships from the Grand Khan came there. All right, Large ships from who? From the Grand Khan came there and that from there to the Tierra Firme, right, or South America or Central America was a journey of 10 days. This probably indicates that the Lucayo people were also familiar with Yucatan or Mexico since North America would have been less than 10 days from Cuba and large ships would probably refer to Mesoamerican or South American freight boats. Colón also learned by signs that people from Northwest used to come to fight them many times, presumably referring to people from the Florida area. At this connection, we can refer here to information found in Pedro Martir de Anglerias, Décadas del Nuevo Mundo, after he had discussed the seizure of some 40,000 indigenous uh, people 
of both sexes carried off for slave labor. Listen, what they're doing, 40,000 are Peter Martyr, right? Listen, this is a primary source. Peter Martyr wrote, right? Wrote way back that they had seized 40,000 indigenous people of both sexes carried off for slave labor in Cuba and Haiti. It wasn't Africans they were bringing there. You guys starting to see all these numbers at up, right? Through all these videos. The Spaniards to satisfy their inexhaustible hunger for gold. The Islas Yucayas. By the 1520s had become a desert. The Lucayans, remember, they were also bringing them to, make, to die for pearls in South America and Venezuela and all that. So it had become a desert. But referring back to an earlier period, he describes how three Yucayos attempted to escape on a raft from Haiti but were apprehended 200 miles to the north by a Spanish vessel returning from Chicora, South Carolina. All right, you see that? From South Carolina, Pedro Martir goes on to relate that so many palomas, pigeons, live in the branches of the Jaruma trees, that the inhabitants of the great island of Bimini and of the territory of Florida come there to hunt them, and they return with their boats full of pichones. It is also told that the Yukaya women are so beautiful that many inhabitants of the nearby lands, attracted by their beauty, abandon their own homes in order to establish themselves for love of them in these places as a new country. This is, they say, the reason that many of the Yukayas or Lucayans, right? Uh, islands have customs which are more civilized like those farther away of florida and bimini regions of older major culture lopez de gomara writing several decades later repeats the story that many men of the mainland such as from florida chicora south carolina and yucatan took themselves to live with the beautiful lucayo women and for that reason, they had more public order among themselves than in other islands and much diversity of languages. He also notes that there are so many palomas and other birds living in the trees so that people come from the continent and from Cuba and Haiti to take them and they return with the canoes full of them. It seems likely that Lopez and Martir obtained their material from the same source. Nonetheless, it seems quite clear that the Lucayos had contact with the mainland of North America and that Americans would have crossed the Florida Channel frequently, thus being directly exposed to possible journeys, involuntary or otherwise, in the Gulf Stream. Interestingly, the Yuchi Nation, right? The Yuchi, remember, from Georgia, now of Oklahoma, but they were from Georgia, has a tradition of having in part at least originated on an island of the Bahamas Lucayo, listen to this. This could be related to the possibility that Lucayo people successfully fled to the coast of Chicora during the 1500s, 1520 period in order to escape Spanish slave raids. Evidence of this can be seen in the fact that so called Cusabo people of Chicora, right, of South Carolina, the Cusabo people, listen, in the 17th century used the term bow for river, as in their name for the Savannah River, Westo Bow. River of the Westo. Bo is an Arawak word meaning river or water. The Yushi lived for a time at Augusta, Georgia, not far from coastal Chicora, and could have observed Arawakan refugees from the Bahamas. Interestingly, some scholars have argued that baby hammocks used by the Yuchi may reflect the Caribbean influence. Cologne's diary also reveals that the Cubans knew of Haiti and that behind it lay a landmass of exceedingly large size, which must have been North America. The Americans of Haiti knew that behind Cuba, to the south, there is another big island called Jamaye, Jamaica. The Admiral says he also learned that toward the east there was an island where there were women only, Matinino, and that the island of Haiti, or the other island of Jamaye, right, Jamaica, was near mainland 10 days journey by canoes, which could be 60 or 70, 70 leagues, and that the people there were clothes, all right, clothes in Central America and South America. Thus the Haitians knew of Cuba and Jamaica, any mainland beyond, doubtless Yucatan or Mexico, and also the Antilles as far as Matinino. The Italian Cuneo understood on the second voyage that La Mahique was five days from Cuba. 
with a difficult voyage going or returning, doubtless because of currents. Mm -hmm. This reference may well be of mixing up of Jamaica and Yucatan due to the misinterpretation of signs. There is also strong indication that Cubans traveled to Florida and even established some settlements there. According to Colon's testimony, his belief in the existence of a very great continent to the south of the islands was due in part to the information about South America received from Native Americans of Guadalupe, St. Croix, Borinquen. Hernando the Sun tells us that Colon learned from women on Guadalupe that to the south were many islands, some of which were inhabited. This woman and others called those islands Jaramaki, Antigua. Cairoaco or Curaçao, Huino, Buriari or Bonaire, Arubeira or Aruba, and Sixi Bay. Sixi Bay, <laughs> the mainland which they said was very large. Both they and the people of Espanola, Haiti called Suania, Guiana or Guiana, they said that in former times canoes had come from that land to trade, bringing much gold. From the same women they learned where the island of Hispaniola lay. Thus the people of the Antilles knew of South American coast and islands from Guiana, Suania to Aruba and also knew of Haiti to the north. The people of Haiti are also said to have known of Guiana and the southern mainland. There is no question that the Caribs in particular were in frequent contact with South America. On Guadeloupe, the Spaniards found guacamayos, parrots that are only found on the mainland and the coast of Paraya and beyond. Evidence that the Caribs traveled great distances, 150 leagues or more, is frequently found. Supposedly much of this travel was for military purposes, but the subject is complex and the widespread trading guani or guanin and alloy of copper, gold and other metals along with other commerce from the south suggests that the raiding caribs may be a european invention in order to produce an enemy listen population eligible for enslavement remember they named them cannibals they said they were invading other people look at this evidence of widespread travel is also provided in the diaries and letters by reference to exotic items or words one example includes cow skulls that cologne saw in the bahamas these skulls can most likely be interpreted as buffalo skulls traded over vast distances from North America. A second example consists of the South American parrot, already noted. Other examples include honeycombs found on Cuba that must have come from Yucatan and feathers of the red spoonbill heron exported from Cuba to Mexico. Reference has always been made to Taino people from the Bahamas to Cuba and Jamaica being acquainted with Yucatan and other areas of the mainland. When Spaniards reached the area of Yucatan in 1517 and again in 1518, they found that the Maya people were already partially aware of what had transpired on the islands invaded earlier by the Europeans. The Maya at Cabo de Catoche in 1517 made signs to us with the hands asking if we came from the direction of the sunrise and saying Castilan, Castilan, and we could not comprehend what they meant by Castilan. This is according to Bernal Diaz de Castillo, a very unreliable authority. Diaz also tells us that in 1518, the Spaniards met an American woman from Jamaica on the island of Consumel, all right? She told them, that two years earlier she had started from Jamaica with 10 Indians in a large canoe intending to go and fish near some small islands and that the currents had carried them over to this land where they had been driven ashore and that her husband and all the Jamaica Indians had been killed and sacrificed. It seems more likely that the Jamaicans had fled from their home to avoid Spanish slave raiders and that they did not want to fall under European control. Thus her story. We must bear in mind that Diaz was writing some 50 years later that Cubans taken to Yucatan by Juan de Grijalba in 1518 were uniformly treated well by the Maya. When sent to Maya villages unaccompanied by Spaniards and that Oviedo, a second-hand source but one closer in time, mentions only that some of the Jamaicans had been killed and that the others had fled somewhere else. 
In any case, it seems likely that Jamaicans had reached Yucatan and that the Maya knew of Castilans, Spaniard Castilians, from them or other native people. As we shall see, there is also archaeological evidence supporting ancient contacts between Mesoamerica and the Caribbean islands, although Caribbean cultures on balance are more closely connected with South America in trade, cultural relationships, and in myth. The guanin traded throughout the Caribbean seems likely to have been derived from the Cuaca Valley of Colombia, primarily reaching the islands via the Paraya region. The evidence tends to support a continuity of navigational ability all around the inner Caribbean, in the islands, and along the Guiana coast. Geronimo Benzoni, all right, we've gone over him and what he did, this, this conquistador, this slaver, it's going to mention it right here, it says in the early 1500s joined a Spanish expedition to capture slaves along the coast of Venezuela that utilized very large piraguas, boats employed by the natives, which could hold up to 50 persons, all right, again, who are they enslaving, this is what I'm trying to I emphasize and, and make you guys understand, you know, what Africans, the Spanish and Portuguese, but when they knew they had local labor here, free labor, they can enslave. Benzoni was one of the biggest uh, enslavers doing this in South America, right? This is just one little mention of him. I read all accounts of what he was doing, what they were doing to the Indians and how they were putting them in these ships and they were dying on the way and how they were branding them and everything. In 1604, Captain Charles Lay voyaged along the Guiana coast as far as the Amazon estuary to the north on the river Huiapogo. Plantons were obtained from the Americans along with honey, all right? The land of milk and honey, right? Honey. Subsequently, the English learned of Caribs arriving in eight warlike canoes, one of which was subsequently abandoned. Lay notes that their canoes are able to carry 20 men and big for 10 days. Two years later, Henry Challens reached Santa Lucia in Dominica on a voyage to Virginia that miscarried. At Santa Lucia, they saw certain of the savages there, about 40 or 50, came unto us at our ship in one of the, their canoes, bringing unto us tobacco, potatoes, plantains, and cassava bread. They then proceeded to Dominica, where they met a Spanish priest in an incident that will be discussed below as it involves the question of the use of sails. Large boats were also made along the Orinoco River. Antonio Vasquez de Espinosa, in the period between 1612 and the 1620s, described boat making among the Tibes people. They are so patient and ingenious that from a tree which they call vice and from another called bagasa, which are monstrous heights and thickness, they manufacture with a scrap of iron which they wheat and sharpen like an adze, a boat or dugout which will hold from 400 to 600 jugs of wine and 60 persons with all that is necessary for their food and maintenance. Fernando de Oviedo, writing a century earlier, tells us that the Americans of the Cartagena region, right, that's in Colombia, or Cardish, right, Cardish, Cartagena, that's how you say it in Spanish, were able to utilize huge trees and making canoas, which are boats in which they navigate so large that in some go 100 and 130 men, all right? 130 people fill these canoes, right? These are ships, okay? Ships. And they are a single piece of one tree. And some are wide enough so that a barrel or cask can be held and people can still pass on each side. And some are wide as 10 or 12 palms. Willem H. Sears, notes that historical sources seen by him document canoes in the 60 to 80 foot range for both the Antilles and northern South America. He goes on to assert that physical laws make a comparatively narrow dugout a very easily propelled form. Paddles could easily move such holes without strain to spread in excess of six knots. 24 hours at such speeds covers a lot of water. As regards the caribs of the islands some of our best descriptions come from a work credited to Charles de Rochefort, sometimes known as Caesar de Rochefort. From the middle of the 17th century, the author, perhaps the father, Raymond Brenton, states that the Caribs of Dominica took great pain in the making of their piragas, or vessels, wherein they go to sea. These vessels are made of one great tree, which they make hollow, smooth, and polished with an unimaginable 
dexterity, the greater sort of piragas, are many times raised, raised higher all about, especially towards the poop with some planks. These shallops are so large as many times to carry 50 men with all their arms, before acquiring metal tools. They were obliged as the Virginians and some of the other savages were to set fire at the foot of the trees, and so they undermined the tree by little and little. Among the officers of the Caribs was a captain of a piraga, and these are named Teobotuli Canoa. Also, amongst those who have every one the command of vessel in particular, they have also an admiral or general at sea. All right, so listen, they got these titles, right? Navigational titles, the, the American Indians, who commands the whole fleet. Him they call Nalini or Nalin. On war expeditions, next to the care they take about their arms, they also provide themselves sufficiently with belly timber and take along with them in their little vessels good quantities of cassava, boiled fish, fruits, and particularly bananas, which keep a long time, and the meal of maniac. They also, along with native Brazilians, take along with them to the wars a certain number of women to dress their meat and to look to the piragas when they are got ashore. Their custom is to go from island to island to refresh themselves, and that end they have gardens, even in those which are desert and not inhabited. All right, you listen to that? The American Indians had gardens in, in these uninhabited islands. They would go get their produce and stuff. Nobody would touch it. All right, but they would go to these islands just to grow food, just to grow food and have a garden. That's amazing, right? They also touch at the islands of their own nation to join their forces. Their ancient and irreconcilable enemies are the Arawakas. Alugues, who live in that part of America, which is known as Guiana or Guiana, the cause of this immortal enmity between our insular Caribbeans and those people have been already hinted in the chapter of origin of the Caribbeans to wit that those Aruagis have cruelly persecuted the Caribbeans of the continent, their neighbors, the relations of our islanders, and that they have continually warred against them to exterminate them or at least to drive them out of their habitations. The Caribs of the islands were not themselves directly attacked by the Arawaks. Island Caribs came from as far away as Santa Cruz St. Croix, a distance of 300 leagues to attack the Arawaks of Guiana. All right, so we do have a back and forth history between these people and war, as you guys can see here in history. Rochefort also notes that the Caribs and defending themselves from Spanish slave raids, all right, from what? From Spanish slave raids. Who were the Spanish and Portuguese, these Moorish Sephardic Jews, really enslaving? They weren't going to Africa. We've broken all this down in previous videos and my older, older videos. If you're new to my channel, make sure to catch up, go way back and work your way up. Uh, the enslavement of the American Indians, the indigenous people of America happened in a very large scale and as it says here so Rochefort also notes again that the Caribs and defending themselves from Spanish slave raids were often able to capture Spanish ships which they looted and then burned true it is they pardoned the Negro slaves they met with and having brought them ashore put them to work in their habitations thence came the Negroes which they have at present in St. Vincent's and some other islands perhaps ancestors of the later Garifuna of Belize after intermarrying with indigenous Americans. All right, so we're going to touch the hijack because Negroes does not automatically mean you're coming out of Africa. Again, that could be other American Indians. It could be black Europeans, black Irish, Sephardic Jews, Moors, all these people that were being uh, also transported as undesirables to the American colonies. So touch the hijack with assumptions and conjectures because we do have the research and we do have historical documents these people these companies these ventures did document who they were enslaved one can see that the island caribs were certainly very capable at sea with enough experience to allow them to survive voyages across the atlantic if necessity required Antonio Vasquez de Espinosa saw tremendous use of dugout boats by Americans in the Caribbean, Venezuelan region between 1612 and 1620. 
a use apparently little changed by European intrusion, because the region around the Windward Islands, Trinidad and the Orinoco mouth was still basically in American hands. Dugouts were used on all the rivers for inland travel, but also for extensive voyaging at sea. The navigation and route of the natives of the island of Trinidad passed through the Dragon's Mouth, which lies seven leagues from the islands of Trinidad, all right, the Dragon's Mouth. In spite of the dangerous waters, the Americans navigated as far as Margarita Island off of Venezuela, as well as southward, all right? If you guys watched my pearl diving video, uh, we proved there was American Indians they were using as so-called slaves. These other Negroes, they were bringing Lucayans, actually. They were from Lucayan Bahamas. They were bringing there too. Margarita Island, they were making people dive down there. There's a lot of pearls. So as you can see, they've been going over there getting pearls on their own. Um, we read that in the video that they were diving for pearls for thousands of years already. They were the experts. So they've been traveling back and forth from this place, as you can see. The Caribs of the Granada area called Camayuyas, along with other Windward Islanders, went with their dugout navies and robbing expeditions along the whole coast of the Spanish main. All right, robbing like pirates, robbing navies, the island of Trinidad and Margarita and others. The Camayuyas had captured a Portuguese slave ship and had colonized 500 Africans from the ship on a small island Poto Poturo. All right, so we're going to dodge the hijack when we're reading these things because, again, they're saying Africans because they were listed as Negroes. This author does believe in the other Africa theories. He's going with that. But when you look at the primary sources of these people and what Portuguese ship that is and where it's coming from, you'll see who, who the cargo in this ship really is. All right, so dodge your own hijack. So prove it. And as you can see, he has no uh, sources for that part. You see, there's no uh, footnote, no number for the African part. <laughs> According to Vasquez de Espinosa, a naval war between Araucas of Trinidad with 60 dugouts and the Garina Caribs of the Orinoco with 120 dugouts was fought in 1596 on one of the channels of the Great River. All right, so you see all these warships. So 120 warships on the Carib side and 60 on the Arawak side fighting each other in 1596. You see, these are primary sources, first-hand accounts. All right, as you can see, there is a footnote. So there is a footnote here, 43. When you click on it, you see down here, footnote, Jean-Baptiste Duterte. All right, again, that was from 1600s. He wrote that first-hand account. The Warao people. Ancient inhabitants of parts of the Orinoco Delta region of Venezuela and Guyana are well known as notable seagoing and canoe using people. All right, the Warao, a Warao. Johannes Wilbert, who has worked extensively with the Warao, states that besides easily accommodating 100 people, all right, 100 people in their ships, right. The Warao boats can take three cannons, as they did in the 17th and 18th centuries. It is believed that the Warao were pioneers in the earliest settlement of the Antilles and Florida. All right. Timucua being a related language. All right. You hear that? The Warao and the Timucuan language are similar. Since the place names throughout the Caribbean are definitely Warao, they can be interpreted without stretching the language in any way. Haburi, the ancient culture hero of the Warao. Haburi, all right? Haburi. <laughs> Hiburi. Hiburi. Haburi. Invented canoes prior to people existing on the earth. Canoe making is considered divine service, accompanied by chants and poetry. A canoe maker must go through spiritual preparation and receives great recognition for successful voyages okay it's not just anybody who just goes out in a canoe okay the warao as early as 1595 were trading with trinidad for tobacco but their seafaring goes back to prehistoric times it goes back to prehistoric times the voyage from the orinoco to trinidad is difficult but the warao also recalled when the shallow depressions between the two areas was not filled with water. 
thousands of years ago they still remember when it was like hey that was just one land before that was one island we used to go to that's how old these people's been in this area what our canoes often have planks to heighten the sides latched together to the gunwale with vines the hole is also widened by means of fire hot water and cross poles they also use sails of leaf stock matting or triangular ones of cloth in the upper delta the mast for sail rests in a step mounted on the bottom of the boat it is also supported by two mast partners the Warao's large canoes are categorized by Wilbert as seagoing vessels with a paddle mounted at the stern lashed to the gunwale at, as a rudder we can assume i believe that other caribbean area american groups had canoe using customs and procedures similar to the Warao turn into the region of Central America and the Maya. We find that later sources confirm what Colon had found, that the Americans were builders of large boats, right, large ships, not boats, ships, and were active marine time merchants, all right, who the Mayas and Central Americans, active marine time merchants, all right, he's correlating with what we read in Atlantis in America from Ivor Sapp, right? but the ancient navigators of Central America. So now we got Jack Forbes confirming that the Americans were builders of large ports and were active marine time merchants. Who's the merchants? <laughs> when Spanish corsairs began to touch upon the Yucatan coast between 1517 and 1519, the crewmen noted the extensive Maya use of boats. All right, they were writing this down in the 1500s when they got here right one writer saw about 100 boats uh, ships all right dodged the hijack in one location another author knows that more than 100 canoes or boats with about 3,000 people came toward them you hear that 3,000 people on ships or about 30 persons per boat the same writer also specifically refers to a maya boat with 30 men on board Navigation across the rough waters of the strait between Consumel Island and Yucatan was also described as frequent occurrence by Spanish writers of that period. Lopez de Gomara, writing at second hand, describes Maya boats in connection with the invasion Armada of Hernán Cortés in 1519. He states that during a period of furious wind, a canoe was seen crossing from Yucatan to Acusamil or Consumel a la vela. This is extremely significant because it shows that Mayas were capable of navigating in bad weather and also with a sail. The use of sails by the Maya is apparently confirmed by Bernal Diaz del Castillo, although he writes 50 years after the events and had read Lopez de Gomara's prior to writing. All right, I just want to point out that all these people they're naming, Lopez de Gomara, Bernal Diaz del Castillo, Hernan Cortez, we've read first-hand accounts, we've read their primary sources in a lot of previous videos, especially the older ones, make sure to catch up on that. Diaz notes that in 1517 he saw 10 very large canoes, which are called piraguas, full of Indians native to that population, and they came by oar and sail. These canoes are made like throws and are large and of thick logs and carefully dug out until hollow and all are of one log and there are many of them which can hold 40 indians all right gotta understand these are very large trees you gotta overstand where the cedars of hawaii are really <laughs> the next day a dozen large canoes were seen with indian oarsmen diaz also noted that with their boats the americans navigated by oars from coast to coast all right from coast to coast and there's a footnote for that that's from diaz del castillo himself historia verdadera de las indias de america a letter written within a few months after the invasion of cortez into mexico states the next day at noon a canoe with sail was seen coming in the direction of the island Consumer. Aside from the use of sails, there is also evidence that the Maya and the Aztecs used planks to raise the height of their boats, and that there may have also been the use of a boat of two canoes tied together. 
Such a craft was seen at the lagoon of Bacalar in 1641. Wharf seemed to have also been constructed by the Mexicans on Lake Texcoco and are known archaeologically for the Maya in Quintana Roo and Belize. Some 2,000 years ago, the people living on Chetumal Bay in Belize were trading great distances. They expanded their seafaring culture as time went on, developing a dog for their boats. By the end of the 8th century, all right, 8th century, <laughs> you hear this? This is old. It's about 700 AD. A series of strategic coastal strongholds was established by canoe seafaring peoples. These people were called the Itza by archaeologists, all right, the Itza, the Itza people. Eventually, these merchant warriors, all right, again, these merchant warriors who the Itza merchant warriors founded a permanent port facility on an island off the northern coast, Consumel, where they could command a rich trade. A small island was transformed into a simple, round, and massive platform with masonry docking along its entire periphery for the large dugout canoes used by these peoples. All right, you hear what they did? This is from all the way back in the 8th century. Evidence of pre Columbian navigational activities is also derived from a study of pictures of boats, many with raised ends found in various codices, murals, and sculptured walls of the Mexico-Yucatan region. All right, it's in the walls. A great deal is known about the incredible marine time trade maintained along the Mexican Central American coast by American navigators. Again, correlating with the other book, Atlantis in America. This regular sea trade is especially well documented between Tabasco around Yucatan and onto Honduras with additional trade in gold and other products extending from Nicaragua and Panama to Veracruz. All right. Just want to point out that in between Nicaragua and Panama, right in the middle is Costa Rica. So that's the two countries that we border. So a lot of gold coming out of here, as it says right there. I'm going to show that to you guys. I'm going to go to the Gold Museum and do a video on gold. It's going to be a really good video a series as well. All right, so they were bringing all that up to Mexico, all the way down from here. The coastal area of Tabasco, with its numerous bays and navigable rivers and channels, like the mouths of the Orinoco and other great rivers, is a perfect place for the evolution of marine time skills. It is also a region with adjoining southern Veracruz, where a significant number of language groups came together and sometimes overlapped, including Nahuatl, Nahuatl, Maya, and Mixe Soque. While Tabasco came to be an area of Putun Maya dominance, several Nahuatl speaking towns were located in the midst of the Maya, and one prominent trading center, Chicalango. All right, listen to this. She, Calango. It almost sounds like Chicago, right? So down here in the Tabasco area, which is a Maya dominance area, there is a trading center called Chi Calango. was especially connected to the Mexican or Mexican Nahuan people, the Nahuan people. Evidence indicates that the Triple Alliance of the Valley of Mexico the so-called Aztec Empire and its predecessors maintained a trading connection with Chicalango, although there is contradictory evidence as to whether they controlled it. In any case, the Putun Maya came under considerable Mexican in parentheses and Mixteca Puebla in parentheses cultural influences, which they helped to spread by sea southward as far as Honduras. The Putun appear to have expanded along the coast, at least by the 800 ADs, soon establishing a major mercantile center at Consumel, a major mercantile center, an island along the east coast of Yucatan. That was their hub. That's where they had their center of commerce. You hear this? They also expanded their commercial dominance to the Chetumal region along the Belize coast and down to Nito and Naco in the Guatemala, Honduras region. Putun merchants were permanently stationed in these areas. Jeremy A. Sablov tells us that they were expert sailors and canoers. Their language became a lingua franca of trade from Veracruz 
to Honduras. They were waterborne traders, par excellence, and helped institute econo-political trends which came to characterize the post-classic period. Author G. Miller adds that it is known that there was extensive trade via seagoing vessels from the east coast of the Yucatan Peninsula along the Caribbean coast as far as Nicaragua and Panama. All right. So again, in between those two countries is Costa Rica. This in addition to the vessels plying from Tabasco to the east coast of Yucatan, added to this was the evolution of Consumel and later Tulum as holy shrines of the female spirit power Ixchel. Right, you hear that? The female spirit power Ixchel associated with the moon, childbirth, procreation, weaving, and medicine. You know, a lot of these mythological and ceremonial uh, and deities actually were from uh, ancient America or the so-called Atlantis or Phoenicians, right? Coming out of America and uh, bringing that out into the world. Same stories as you find in uh, Egypt. It's just uh, different names. Miller suggests that the east coast of Yucatan became a kind of Mecca for the Maya, all right? A Mecca for the Maya, what the east coast of the Yucatan, and possibly for many people from the rest of Mesoamerica. It was the Mecca of Mesoamerica. Pre-Columbian pilgrims came to this area, Tulum, Tanka, to be renewed, reborn, an international culture with Mixteca, Puebla, all right? In parentheses, influences developed as a result, one that was flourishing when cut down by Spanish imperialism in the 16th century, and then came the Moors and the Sephardic Jews and the Catholics. The people who built Tulum up after 1440, presumably Putun Maya, controlled the sea. All right, there's all sources for all this stuff. Earlier in the 900s, the Putun had either conquered or helped to conquer the inland city of Chichen Itza. Subsequently, around 987, they facilitated the movement of Toltecs from the inland Tula north of present-day Mexico City. The Toltecs, led by the banished Quetzalcoatl Khan, right, the Toltecas, right, led by Quetzalcoatl Khan, the law-given priest traveled to the Gulf Coast and then reached Chichen Itza, apparently with the help of Putun Maya fleets and marine facilities. The Putun and their allies continued to be powerful maritime factors until at least 1536. All right? So you see how all this has been going on with the Spanish guy here? There was a vast empire. They were seafarers. There was trade. There was a lot of people here, a lot of culture, a melting pot of Mecca, as they're telling you here. When they sent an expedition of 50 war canoes from Chetumal to aid Ulua, Honduras, against the Spaniards, later the season warfare almost eliminated the Indians of coastal Honduras. All right, you see? With the surviving Maya probably being absorbed by Hikake survivors, Inland in Tabasco and Chiapas, however, the canoe using Akalan Putun were able to remain independent until 1695 in part of their former territory. The significance of Putun Maya and related marine time activity can hardly be overrated, all right? It can't be overrated. Hernan Cortez, speaking of interviews with the men of Chicalango and Tabasco, noted that some of them had been to most of the towns along the coast and could describe them as far as the residents of Pedrarias, the villa in Panama. We also know that their influence reached up the Veracruz coast and into the interior as far as Tula, Hidalgo. We can suggest that they were also in contact with the Caribbean islands from evidence cited earlier and from archaeological and ethnological evidence to be discussed below. In the future, perhaps other scholars will be able to enlighten us with detailed studies of Americans as pilgrims to sacred sites, as well as of regular routes of marine time trade. It seems clear then that the Caribs and other Americans were ideally prepared for stormy seas, being able to swim great distances and having their supplies protected from the vessels overturning. It would also seem highly likely that the Caribs, like the natives of the Canary Islands, knew how to use sails of palm matting prior to European contact. 
Only such a tradition could have allowed for the transition to cotton or other cloth sails, since one must first know how to fasten the sails to the boat. It does little good to have a cloth sail if the technology of erecting and securing mast and harnessing with wind power is lacking. But especially compelling is the evidence already cited for Cartagena and Yucatan, coupled with reports relating to the use of sails in the Orinoco and Amazon basins. The use of sails, cotton or madden by Americans is well documented for the Pacific coast of South America and Central America. It would be incredible if such use did not also occur on the Caribbean side of the Isthmus of Panama. Hiroalmo de Benzoni depicts a sail on an American raft around 1550, while a description of the huge freight raft captured by Spaniards in 1527 off of Peru includes reference to masts and yards of very fine wood and cotton sails in the same shape and manner as on our own ships all right just like the spanish ships what a huge fright that's what they got a huge ship they found in peru a sail has been recovered along with toy rafts from aboriginal graves in northern chile pierre barreri includes in his novel relation de la france equinoxi published in 1743 a drawing of a carib pirogus from french guiana one of which has a sail made of palm matting it is flat, supported by a wooden pole as a mast. He also refers to pirogus of 30 to 40 feet length and describes the use of planks. Evidence relating to the knowledge of sailing principles and to the general navigational capabilities of the Caribbean natives is provided by the case in 1516 when 70 or 80 Spaniards in a caravel and a Bergantin brig sailed from Santiago de Cuba to the Guanacha Islands off of Honduras, now Roatan. There they enslaved many peaceful Guanacha people and carried them in the caravel to Havana, Cuba. Again, another account I want you guys to see. When we did those videos, we shown who the Spanish and Portuguese were really invading. It was really mostly when they came here, it was American Indians. They were putting into these so-called slave ships, right? And they were bringing where? To Cuba or Hispaniola, right? And then they told us in school they were bringing Africans. They were replacing the local uh, indigenous population with so-called Africans. But nah, look, they were replacing them with other American Indians from the Guanacha people in Honduras, all right? And they were bringing them where? To Havana, Cuba, who the Sephardic Jews, more of the Catholics, they were enslaving American Indians, not Africans. The Americans were subsequently able to overcome a few Spanish guards, seize the sailing ship, y haciéndonose a la vela, cual si fueran expertos navegantes, volvieron a su patria que distaba más de 200 lenguas. In short, the Americans were such expert navigators that they were able to sail from Havana to Honduras, a distance of more than 200 leagues in a European vessel with no assistance from any non-Americans and this after having been kept below decks during their journey to the Havana. Clearly they knew something about sails. It seems very likely that they also had prior experience navigating between Cuba and the Gulf of Honduras, all right? Did you guys pay attention to that last part, all right? It's primary sources and everything. Because we always hear of these uh, uh, slaves taking over ships, so-called Africans, right? And, and shipwrecking in the coast. And that's how you get these so-called black populations in Central America and all this stuff. That's all fable stories. This is one example right here. One example. It wasn't Africans. American Indians, right? From the Guanacha people of Honduras overtook the ship in Cuba and sailed by themselves all the way back to their home land. That's what I read in Spanish before they, they didn't translate that part. They said they went back to their home land. They knew how to navigate. Many other examples of long voyages undertaken by Americans under adverse circumstances can also be cited. In 1738, or 1739, some native Peruvians managed to escape from servitude in the Juan Fernandez Islands in a simple canoe. Again, who was being enslaved? From Peruvians. All right, indigenous people from Peru in the 1700s, they escaped 
from this place who had them there spaniards portuguese right they weren't they didn't have africans there they had peruvian indigenous people and this juan fernandez island in a simple canoe they escaped right without provisions and supplies they successfully made their way eastward to valparaiso that's in chile some 360 miles over open ocean in spite of difficult winds and currents 360 miles of open sea turning to the atlantic coast of north america we find that americans also went out to sea on the south carolina coast for example the seaweed outfitted boats with sails and on one occasion a group of them reportedly decided to visit england okay okay american indigenous people from south carolina got on a boat ship and went to they wanted to go to england they got on the currents and say hey let's ride the current all the way they outfitted a canoe with sails and went out into the atlantic but were picked up by british vessel and sold as slaves who indians from south carolina american indigenous people from south carolina enslaved by the english so-called english these pirates privateers not africans okay you see how the, it starts adding up real accounts real primary sources do your research this apparently was prior to european colonization this is way before they started colonizing they were already enslaving who this is what i've been trying to show you in 1524 verasano all right verasano we got his famous voyage we're gonna get his book we're gonna read try to read most of it saw dugout boats perhaps near chesapeake bay that were 20 feet long and four feet broad while canoes were seen at or near narragansett bay going out to sea with 14 or 15 men in them he also saw how dugouts large enough to hold 10 or 12 persons were made one report from later date states that the americans navigated between new jersey new york and the chesapeake bay using canoes specially outfitted with sails and decks but when they want to go distant over the sea as for instance to virginia or new holland then they fastened two punts canoes dug out together broadwise with timbers over them right strongly put together the deck made completely tight and sideboard of planks sails of rugs and frieze cloth joined together ropes and tackle made of bass and slender spruce roots and they also mason for themselves a little fireplace on deck they even had a fireplace on the deck in 1643 roger williams published his key into the language of america in which he included many words relating to kitang the sea an indian boat or canoe made of pine oak or chestnut was called meshun of greater interest is the word sepa kehik for a sail and sepa ke homauta for let us sail and wuna hegan for we have a fair wind williams notes their own reason has taught them to pull off a coat or two and set it up on a small pole with which they will sail before a wind 10 or 20 miles he then goes on to add additional sailing expressions it is wonderful to see how they will venture in those canoes and how being off oversight i have myself been with them they will swim a mile yet yeah, two or more safe to land i haven't been necessitated to pass waters diverse times with them it has pleased god to make them many times the instrument of my preservation their word for anchor is kuno snap thus showing that the narragansetts of rhode island were well equipped for sea navigation and for survival at sea indeed an englishman writing 20 years earlier noted that the massachusetts americans were very adventurous in their boats although reportedly not going all the way to virginia horace p beck in his study of native americans as sea fighters after european contact provides numerous examples of superb seamanship in the northeast region including the capture of european longboats and vessels equipped with sails Beck cites sources that asserts that Americans were operating a Biscay shallop with sails, oars, and eight crewmen along the main coast in 1602, and that seven years later, the country people possessed two French shallops 
somewhere near Penescot Bay. Beck then goes on to give many examples of native seamanship in New England during the 17th and 18th century. He also cites evidence that Americans were harpooning whales in New England waters as early as 1605 and that they may have taught the later white settlers how to take whales at sea. All right, so that's a big one right there. And I'm glad they brought this up because that's uh, part of a future video. We're going to be studying about the whaling history and also how it what it has to do with you know american indians because they were the first ones doing this and they were the ones who did teach the europeans about whaling but dodge the hijack when we say white settlers they were teaching sephardic and moorish people portuguese mainly the portuguese and what does this have to do with cape verdeans all my cape verdean people out there you guys already know the history of, of your people in whaling and this was an American indigenous thing. I'm going to show a lot of the blood of the uh, Cape Verdeans is American Indian with the uh, Sephardic Moorish people. That's most of their ancestry. There is also some evidence for the use of sails in the St. Lawrence River in pre-Columbian times. And one archaeologist thought that he found evidence for the use of sails in pre-European contact site in the southeastern United States. To the south, along the Brazilian coast, the Portuguese and other Europeans also witnessed American navigation at sea and Italian traveling with Magellan in 1519. With Magellan in 1519, noted that the Brazilians' boats were made from the trunk of a tree. Son tan grandes estos árboles. All right, these trees are so big, he said. Que una sola canoa caben 30 y aun 40 hombres que bogan con remos parecidos a las palas de nuestros panaderos. Thus the boats held 30 to 40 men according to Piga Feta. In the 1550s, Hans Statens noted that the dugout boats of the Santos Rio de Janeiro area could hold up to 30 men, were 4 feet in width, with some being larger and some smaller. In these, they moved rapidly with oars, navigating with them as far as they wish. When the sea is rough, they take canoes ashore until good weather comes again. They do not go more than two leagues straight out to the sea, but along the coast they navigate far. In 1565, the Jesuit José de Anchiera stated that the Americans of the same region had dozens or more canoas. Thus, the Brazilian boats were also very well made, were very fast and maneuverable, and could be righted at sea if necessary. They were used to carry 30 or more persons and supplies, considerable distances along the coast, as for example from Santos, San Vicente to Rio de Janeiro. It is also interesting that evidence exists for the large-scale migration of South Americans by canoe, such as the movements of the Tupi from the south coast of Brazil up to the Bahia area and then up to the Amazon a great distance Similarly, evidence exists for Carib movements by waters to new homelands. In 1618, another visitor wrote of the Newfoundland boats as follows. The natives have great store of red ochre, which they use to color their bodies. Come on, now the red paint people, the red soil people, what they do? They cover their bodies. This red oak is high up there. That was their base. The red paint people that were ancient navigators. We did the video on it. Go check it out, which they used to color their bodies, bows and arrows, and canoes with all, which canoes are built in shape, like the wherries on the rivers of Thames, but that they are much longer, made with the rinds of birch trees, which they sew very artificially and close together, and overlay every scene with turpentine. Much earlier, in 1508 or 1509, right? Seven Americans were picked up at sea by French vessel and taken to ruin in France. The description of the American boat indicates that it was either manned by Newfoundlanders or by Micmacs from the Cape Breton region. All right, listen to this: Micmacs or Newfoundlanders going? They were going to Europe, and they got picked up along the way in the middle of the ocean by the French. Two original accounts exist describing this event. The first of which is added as an appendix by either Joannes Multivalis or Hericulum Stephanum, Henry Estienne, to the Chronicon of Eusebius for the year of 1509. 
The account states in abbreviated late Latin, all right? So here it is in Latin. Translated the above means that seven sylvan or rustic men, <laughs> rustic sylvan, right, copper colored men were brought from an island called Terra Nova to ruin with their boat clothing and weapons. They were of darkish complexion with thick lips. Listen, they're describing the American Indians of Terra Nova, Newfoundland, and Canada. Listen, this is what they did. They found them in the open sea. They were heading over to Europe. Micmacs, listen. Micmacs, most likely, they're described as darkish complexion with thick lips, with marks on their faces extending along the jaws from the ears to the chin like livid veins. Their hair was black and Thick like horse's mane, thick hair, thick like a horse's mane. Their boat was of a bark and a man may raise it aloft to his shoulders with one hand. All right. You see how they describe the American Indians? We're not making this up. We can't make this up. The above account published in 1512 has been alleged to refer to a voyage undertaken by Thomas Albert of Dieppe in 1508. The latter is given credit for bringing the men to ruin in the following year by several later sources, including an anonymous letter of 1539 written by a Frenchman of Dieppe and published by Giovanni Ramusio in Italian. A few years later, Pierre Bayard, writing in the early 1600s, also refers to Aubert's bringing the Americans to Europe but it's likely that he was copying Ramusio, since he states that he read about the event. I believe that an argument can be made to support the notion that American shipbuilding and navigation may have been more advanced in ancient than in modern times. The pattern of cultural influences that existed along the Pacific coast from Bolivia, Tijuanaco, Peru, and Ecuador, north to western Mexico, suggests regular intercommunication by sea at very early date probably back to 5,000 years ago. Similar cultural connections probably existed between Louisiana, Mexico, and Peru from 5,000 before the present, okay? You see that? Louisiana, Mexico, and Peru, a connection. This was going back, what? 5,000 years before the present. Similarly, the intensive and extensive influence of Mesoamerica in the southeastern United States and the Ohio Valley, okay, trade with Ohio Valley, the Hope Will culture, okay, the start of it all, Ohio future video, suggests regular marine time contact that probably diminished after about 1450. So you see what's happening in the Americas before 1450, before the Europeans got here, before Columbus, right, 1492, there was trade going on with the people of Hope Will. Right, the Hopewell culture and all these ancient Suan tribes, because that's the origins uh, of the Suan people, right there, right, and other tribes that are from Ohio. And they were trading with Mexico, ancient Peru, and we've seen the uh, pottery, we've seen the pipes show toucans and animals from Central America and South America. So we do know there was trade going on with the mound builders. It's ancient, all right, it's ancient. It should be noted, however, that when the English invaded Virginia in 1607, they learned of rumors to the effect that several Powhatan leaders were of Mesoamerican origin. Oh, major drop right here. Wahunsonacac and Opec Cancano. That is, they had come from New Spain. All right, several of what the Powhatan leaders were Mesoamerican in origin. On the whole, however, it seems likely that Mesoamerican contact must have been greater in the pre-1450 period than later. For example, the artwork found on shells at the Spiral Mount, Oklahoma, 1000 of 1500 AD, seems to this writer to be part of the Mesoamerican culture area, and the shells used were from either Veracruz or Florida. At Cahokia, Illinois, a marker resembling the Maya time symbol has been found from the same general period. Okay, you see, it's all the same. This period, the contact, the trade, the networking, the people, the culture, it's all going down before 1450. Archaeologists and other scholars are developing a better understanding of the antiquity of navigation and maritime trade in the Caribbean region. William H. Sears tells us that 
Starting thousands of years before the birth of Christ, touch the hijack, one trade or cluster after the other points to contacts and origins across the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico. To me, the accumulated evidence strongly suggests movement up through the Antilles and or across the Gulf of Mexico by many groups of people over several millennia. Such groups brought to North America, especially Florida, the Timucua language, okay, the Timucua, they brought it up from South America. Shell tools, maize, horticulture, especially adapted for Florida's topography, methods of preserving maize, fiber tempered pottery, and certain forms of decoration. Important also was the spread of Nicotiana rustica and the tobacco complex from South America, an event that would appear to extend back to very ancient times. You see what they're telling you? That tobacco was actually South American, it was introduced to the North Americans anciently by their South American cousins. There are numerous South American influences in the Caribbean, but there are also important Mexican Yucatecan influences such as the ritual ballgame complexes of Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic featuring the use of Mesoamerican style yokes or collars, okay? We've gone over this same exact information in my ancient American sports video of the uh, ancient ball courts of America and how they had these jokes and collars around the ball players and we found that in uh, Mesoamerica and in Puerto Rico and other islands, it's the same thing. The Timucua language of Florida connects with Warao of the Orinoco in about 75% of its basic structures and processes. You hear that? Timucua and the Warao people language. The Timucua and the Warao almost speak the same language. Both languages also have a proto-Arawak stratum. A split about 2000-3000 BC is suggested. That's a long time ago. Sears argues that about 3,000 to 5,000 years ago, movements by sea occurred between South America to Florida with influences continuing. Donald W. Lafrap commented in 1977 that the entire Caribbean area was a wide open avenue. As early as 3000 BC with the Taino perhaps dominating early trade with Mesoamerica. Honduran obsidian has been found underwater in Jamaica, illustrating one possible item of trade. There is also some indication of seaborne raiding of the Yucatan coast by Caribbean peoples. In addition, there is evidence of the linguistic influence of Arawak and Carib languages upon Maya and other Mesoamerican tongues, suggesting periods of intensive contact by sea. In the next chapter, we shall see that marine time activity in North America extends back to at least 8,000 years ago. Along the Pacific coast of America, trading between the Americans of the Santa Elena Peninsula, Ecuador, and the west coast of Mexico goes back to 1500 BC. The South Americans were also trading with Costa Rica between 100 BC and 600 CE. Okay, with Costa Rica. Between about 1500 and 1100 BC, the Machalila of Ecuador were in contact with the northern Andean highlands, with the west coast of Mexico, and possibly with Soconusco, Chiapas. Allison C. Paulsen also sees a possible relationship between the Chavin, the Huentar culture of Peru, and the Olmecs of Veracruz, Mexico. That's a big one right there, the who. All right, the Chavin, the Huantar culture of Peru and the Olmecs of Veracruz, Mexico. Paulson argues for a long-term, long-range network of marine time trade along the Pacific coast between southwest Ecuador and western Mesoamerica. The widespread use of rafts by American peoples should also be discussed. Antonio Vasquez de Espinosa, writing of the year 1612 to 1620, when he traveled in Central and South America, makes frequent reference to various types of rafts used on rivers and lakes as well as upon the ocean. Some were built upon bamboo floats while some of Peru were erected upon seal skin floats. A Siete Corrientes on the Rio del Paraguay where it emptied into the Rio de la Plata, he noted that one goes on board rafts built on dugouts. 
perhaps similar to the one used by the Americans who reached Galway in 1470s, right? Galway, Ireland. That's where Columbus met the Indians in Ireland. Rafts were most common on the Pacific side of America, but the Choco used dugouts or rafts in the Panama region. Typically, longer rafts usually had a compartment built up on top of them on the Rio Cauca, Colombia. They built large rafts on it of 40 to 50 bamboos, which they call guaduas. They fastened these together and built a compartment on them, which they call a barbacoa, barbecue, or cooking place. Okay, a barbecue, a barbacoa. Yes, barbecue comes from American Indians. Yes, from the indigenous people of the Caribbean. All right, barbecue. That was learned from them. Here, they stole their stuff or merchandise so that it will stay dry. In conclusion, we can establish that Americans were often very capable navigators and sailors at the time of the European invasion. With the Circum-Caribbean region being a major area of marine activity, but with other seagoing activities extending along both the North American and South American Atlantic seaboards, in addition, we can argue that this ability in marine time affairs extended back in time, at least predating the settlement of the various islands of the Caribbean and of the Cape Breton Newfoundland region, and probably extending well back into very ancient times, all right? Again, correlating with what we learned in the book Atlantis in America. This marine activity should establish the distinct likelihood that Americans took advantage of the prevailing winds and currents to visit Europe. All right, prevailing, we had better winds and better currents, all right, to visit Europe or were storm blown involuntarily to Europe on various occasions before 1492. All right, so we've reached the end of chapter three. I hope you guys enjoyed this. A lot of great info, as you guys can see. Just more to add to this journey of learning that we're on. Thanks for tuning in once again. We got a lot of videos coming. We're going to keep coming out with new stuff, okay? Much love and respect. Pura Vida. These are the ancient navigators, okay? We civilized the world. Awah.